Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening um, to everyone joining us. Welcome to today's webinar. Today's talk is entitled Conversation Between a Sponsor and a Statistician About Phase 2, 3 Trials in Oncology. My name is Kelsey Brown and I am the Director of Medical Writing Solutions at TransPerfect Life Sciences in London. It's my pleasure to be your moderator for today's session. Um, and just a quick reminder, today's event will run for approximately 60 minutes, and that includes time for a Q&A session with our speakers at the very end. Um, so just a few housekeeping notes here. Um, this session is designed to be interactive, so it works best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers by using the questions chat box in your control panel, and we'll get to those uh, during our Q&A session at the end. If you do require assistance at any time, just reach out to me um, in the control panel and send me a message there. And at this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note this session will be recorded, so um, it'll be made available to you on the IDDI website for viewing within 24 hours after the webinar is complete. This event is proudly hosted by the International Drug Development Institute, IDDI. IDDI is an expert center in biostatistical and integrated eClinical data services provider for pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies in several disease areas, and that includes oncology and ophthalmology. IDDI optimizes clinical development of drugs, biologics, and devices thanks to proven statistical expertise and operational excellence. Founded in 1991, IDDI is headquartered near Brussels, Belgium, with the U.S. Center of Operations in Raleigh, North Carolina. So now we'll go on to um, present our speakers for today. So I'll switch over really quickly. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Kelsey, you want me to take it over from, from here? No. Uh, well, I can go through introductions really quickly and then I'll, I'll let you have it. Oh, uh, I, I saw a prompt to, to take control, sorry. Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, our two speakers are Dr. Laurence Collette, um, Principal Statistician of Consulting Services at IDDI. So Laurence has 25 years of experience in design analysis and publication of clinical trials in oncology. And she's graduated in mathematics at the University Catholique de Louvain and in biostatistics at the Hasselt University and did her PhD at Erasmus University in the Netherlands. And after 25 years of developing cancer treatments, mostly through late phase trials with the European Organization for Research Treatment of Cancer, she joined IDDI to develop and apply her expertise to earlier development phases. She has a special interest in large pragmatic clinical trials and in adaptive designs when they bring a um, efficiency gains outperform their extra complexity. And we also have Dr. Everard Assad, Medical Director at IDDI. And Dr. Assad has nearly 20 years of experience in medical oncology and clinical trial design. He graduated in medicine and trained in internal medicine at, in Sao Paulo and did his fellowship in medical oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. And after Practicing for several years, he shifted his professional career towards education and research in medical oncology and has a special interest in clinical trial methodology, the estimation of endpoints, and the development of novel therapies for cancer patients. So thank you both. I'll, I'll give it over to you now. Thank you, Kelsey. Hello to everyone. So this is the outline of what we plan to do today. I'll play the role of a medical officer in a, in a biotech company. And I need, of course, to expedite the development of my drug. And I have an interest in a phase two, three design that may mitigate risks and be acceptable to regulators. And I need to understand how that works. So whenever we talk about phase two, three, we'll be referring to phase two slash three as is typically as is the typical notation, let's say, for these designs. And, and Laurence will play the role of Laurence Collette. <laughs> the statistician whom I'm consulting for this job, and she'll give us an overview of the possible phase two, three designs, their key operational characteristics, as well as some uh, regulatory and implementation aspects. 
So Laurence, let me set the scene uh, as follows. As you know, traditional sequential development in, in, in different phases, phase two separated by, uh, uh, from phase three can, can be long. So typically we use phase two for, for learning. We, we stop, we see, look at the results. Hopefully we'll have enough information about our drug, the dose, the schedule, uh, eventual biomarkers, what endpoints to use, et cetera. And then we start one or more confirmatory phase three trials. But it so happens that in some situations, it might make sense to expedite things by having a single design. And, and this hopefully can uh, gain some, some time, but I can gain some time by, by doing this. So um, I have an initial question for you. Is this always feasible and acceptable? Um, thank you, Herardo, for the question and the, the very nice summary. Um, I mean, feasible, yes. Acceptable, it depends to, to whom, obviously. Um, I think whether it's, it is wise or not is rather the question. And indeed, um, there is certainly a benefit of lumping two phases of research development provided that uh, at the inception of this combined study, you have enough information already to be able to design most of the elements of your phase three trial. That's something you need to realize. If you do a phase two and then a phase three, you have time in between the two studies to really uh, analyze the results of the, the phase two and maybe learn to, to choose, for example, your primary endpoint for your phase three. Also importantly, if you do have a biomarker, it will mean that uh, doing an integrated phase two, three, you will need to have sufficient advancement into the development of the assay for your biomarker to be already at the stage where you have this definitive or almost definitive assay in place when you start this uh, phase two. So in general, phase two, three trials would be applicable mostly after a number of earlier phase two studies when, when you're already well advanced in your, in your development. I wouldn't do that in general for a very first phase two or very first phase three of, of a new, new drug or new combination. Okay, that makes sense. So, so let's assume that we're in late phase two and I know enough about my drug unless otherwise specified. Then I have other questions for you. Are there different types of phase two, three trials? And importantly, can I use data from patients enrolled in the phase two component in, in, in the final analysis? Can I use data from those patients? In the analysis of the phase three? Yes, mean. Yeah. yes, at the end. Yeah, actually there, there, there are really two different brands or, or breeds of uh, phase two, three studies. The first one is, is say closer to two separate phase trials, a phase two followed by a phase three. But the difference is that the two will be written inside the same protocol, which we call a master protocol, but there will still be separate patients in the phase two and patients in the phase three. Uh, that, I think, has some advantages that it may minimize the operational delay, for example, between the end of the phase two and the start of the phase three. And in this case, uh, what is important is that because the the groups of patients are different in the phase two and the phase three, you may review yourself the phase two results and uh, potentially you may decide to amend your phase three before, before starting it. Um, and again, because there are uh, two different studies actually within the same master protocol, there, there will be no particular concerns over your type one error in the phase three. You just design a phase three as usual without any specificity of uh, statistical methods. Of course, the interest of this is really uh, dependent on the time it takes to get your phase two results, because if it's too long, maybe there is little interest in making the uh, master protocol for the two studies that uh, will have potentially to be amended and that um, you will have to open in, in the sites for the phase two, whereas some sites may decide to drop off during this uh, long time gap. But I think what you had in mind uh, with reusing the patients is really more uh, what strictly we call in statistics inferentially seamless phase two, three trials. So there 
it's very different. It's one single study. So you have a certain number of patients per arm. And the first patients who enter the study are used in the phase two, but they are reused again in the phase three trial. So in that sense, uh, it is more time saving because you, you, you have to recruit less patients. Um, it is potentially patient saving as well, but you may risk to overrun some of your phase two uh, while waiting for the results. Um, and in this case, really, uh, you're reusing the patients from the phase two in the phase three. So uh, it is more what we call uh, an adaptive design. So if you start with just two arms with a go, no go, it will be more like a regular phase three with interim. But otherwise, if you want to make more changes at the end of the phase two, such as treatment arm selection or patient enrichment, a population selection, this will really fall in the category that we call adaptive designs. And those will require particular uh, considerations uh, that are typical to, to this type of, uh, of studies. Okay. Um, I have another set of questions for you. As a sponsor, can I see the results at the end of phase two with the inferentially seamless design? Because that indeed is what I had in mind. If, if the answer is yes, can I influence go-no-go -go decisions uh, between phase two and phase three? Can I even decide what to do in the phase three component of my study only after seeing the phase two results? Oh, when, when you say that the last point, would you mean, for example, to decide on the magnitude of treatment effect that you would go for only after seeing the results of your phase two? Yeah, for example. That would be this, I mean, that, I mean, Phase two, three, because it's especially the inferentially seamless designs, they really are a single trial. So um, in that respect, they need to be designed uh, as a single study. And as any adaptive design, um, we need to allow for some modifications, but uh, an adaptive design to be valid and accepted by regulators will need to have the modifications that we that you envisage the transition between phase two and phase three prospectively planned and written down in your protocol before you start the um, phase, phase two already. So in that respect, you will not uh, be able to do any kind of modification or decisions um, between the uh, phase two and the phase three. So the concerns that are uh, related to this um, reusing of the patients of the phase two in the phase three are really the same as for uh, any adaptive design. Uh, they, they pertain to trial integrity. And in that respect, I'm answering your question whether you can make the decision at the end of the phase two. No, in this case, because it's an in integral trial that encompasses both segments, uh, this phase two decision needs to be taken by an independent body. In general, the IDMC, Independent Data Monitoring Committee, that will have been set up for the entire trial. Also, because there is this um, recycling of patients from the phase two in the analysis of the phase three, there may be uh, issues with the type one error. So there, there needs to be adjustment for the fact that the patients have been used twice. And also, um, there may be also bias in treatment effect, in particular, if you're, if you're doing a selection of treatments and you, you pick a best treatment or a treatment that has the largest effect. So we will need to use a specific methodology to uh, get an unbiased estimate at the end of the phase three, combining the phase two and uh, phase three segments. You see already that if you start, for example, with four arms, as uh, on the image and you continue with two, already the um, recruitment rate will be different between the phase two and the phase three. And you, you, you will also need to account for, for that to some respect in, uh, in your analysis. So we, we essentially fall under two regulatory guidances. Um, sometimes just one of them will apply sometimes both of them will apply. Um, essentially, from the moment that the patients that were entered in the phase two are used again in the phase three, 
as in the example that we called inferentially seamless, these are adaptive designs. Therefore, the adaptive design guidance will uh, strictly apply, and that has some uh, specificities that I just mentioned. Um, once you make a protocol that contains multiple trials, then there is this uh, brand new um, guidance about master of protocols that was emitted by FDA in March of this year that uh, explains how to make uh, an efficient master of protocol. And this will apply not only to uh, phase two, three, but also to platform trials or to basket trials. So essentially those two a uh, guidance document might be relevant to, to, to you if, if you are developing this kind of study. Okay, thank you. But I have to say it's not very clear to me what is the difference between an inferentially seamless phase two three and, and, a, and a phase three trial with an interim analysis, what we might call a group sequential design. Is there a difference? And, and if the answer is yes, when should each be used? Yes, that, that's a good, very good question. Indeed, it's a, it's a subtle difference. So I think we, we're really discussing the case where we have uh, two arms. So that would be really uh, no selection, or you might actually start with more. But the essence is that you would probably have the same endpoint in your phase two and your phase three. And then really, um, you could see the trial as a classical phase three trial with an early stopping rule for fertility. Um, the, the difference between what we call a phase two, three and this would simply be the aggressiveness of the uh, early stopping rule on the final endpoint. Generally, uh, we would have a much, um, a much stronger and much more aggressive fertility stopping rule in a phase two, three than uh, in, in a strict uh, phase three with a, a group sequential design. Now, th there may be an issue in uh, conducting group sequential designs with this kind of aggressive fertility stopping rule is that because you're doing a phase two, you, you would want to really take your decision pretty early in general, earlier than your first interim in, in, in a classical phase three. But uh, in oncology, where we're using uh, time for event endpoints, you can see on this uh, graphic that uh, if we represent with a red line the uh, patients that accumulate in the trial, and in this case, it's a trial of about 200, 340 patients. And in green, we have the accumulation of events uh, in the study, say it's overall survival, we see that events in this case accumulate relatively uh, slowly, and that uh, at, even at the end of the recruitment, we, we still have uh, relatively few patients. So sometimes it's difficult to, to set up uh, a very early uh, decision rule in this case. If, if I give you an example, in this particular study where we have a total of 275 events, if I do my interim analysis at month 16 to be still during the period of accrual of the patients, I only have 30% of events to do the decision. And 30% means 83 events as, as we see above. So if I stop with a rule that is already quite aggressive, which is uh, to stop if the hazard ratio goes in the wrong direction, I see that uh, when I do my analysis is indeed already uh, months uh, 16, and I probably will have already recruited over 200 patients, maybe even 240 patients into the study. So that's pretty late. Um, another element to keep in mind is that by using aggressive stopping boundaries, we also affect the power. For example, if I would want to be even more demanding at the interim if I, because I, I'm looking for a relatively large effect on OS at the end, if I would just say, well, if at that moment I don't see an effect that um, is uh, more than uh, 0.90, so if it's not already a quite strong effect, I would stop, that uh, decision would entail a, a further loss in the power because uh, there is a risk always that um, that you uh, take a wrong decision to stop so that apparently there is no benefit, but you wind up actually if had you continued to, to actually demonstrate a relevant uh, benefit. 
So um, with that, I think, um, I hope I have addressed the uh, rule. Maybe you can so see also that uh, even this um, very strict futility boundary would still continue the trial to the phase three in uh, almost 30% of the instances. So you still have a chance of 30% to continue to the end of your phase three, uh, even with the strict uh, and late stopping boundary. Okay, well, thanks for that explanation. It's um, something else that is not completely clear to me is, do I have to stop accrual at the end of phase two? Uh, and, and importantly, can I use different primary endpoints between phase two and phase three if, if I persist on, on the inferentially seamless design? Yeah, about stopping accrual, of course, you could think of halting the accrual while you're awaiting the uh, results of your phase three. I mean, that in general is something that sponsors want to avoid for, for, for several reasons. One is obviously the time, but also um, from the regulatory standpoint, there will be, if there is a long gap in recruitment inside a unique trial, as we are doing here in the phase two, three, then regulators will probably have concerns as regards the homogeneity of the populations and of the treatment effects that you might see before the interruption and after the interruption. So yes, that's an option, but uh, it, it also may um, deter from the interest and the impetus of the sites to recruit to the study. So it's difficult to reactivate sites after a long stop so if you halt the, the recruitment, which may be sometimes uh, requested by an IDMC, for example, um, that can be done, but generally it should be of a relatively uh, short duration. In terms of uh, whether you can use different endpoints for the phase two and the phase three, yes, uh, that's a very good idea. And that's generally what is done because after, after all, we're doing a phase two inside the phase three. So in general, the endpoints would be uh, chosen to be earlier endpoints. Um, in general, similar to the selection of endpoints in phase two, you would want to have your endpoints for the phase two segment, the early endpoints, associated meaningfully with the final endpoint at the patient level. You want those two endpoints like response and progression-free survival or progression-free survival and overall survival to be related within the patient, one being prognostic for the other. But because we're looking for treatment effects and we're selecting based on a treatment effect, not just based on association at the patient level, we want also a, a sound rationale that this early endpoint is on the causal pathway of the uh, treatment effect onto the final endpoint so that if we at least we, we, we can safely uh, consider that if the treatment does not affect the early endpoint, it will also not affect the uh, late endpoint. So we are not really uh, seeking for a complete surrogate endpoint, for a fully validated surrogate endpoint, but at least to an endpoint that is a necessary condition that uh, the treatment must uh, logically affect that endpoint to uh, have an effect on the final endpoint. Another consideration is also what is the magnitude of effect that you need to expect on your early endpoint to return a certain uh, meaningful effect on your final endpoint that comes closer to true surrogacy, but I think it's an important element uh, to keep in mind. Okay. So I think that uh, makes quite a bit of options that we've uh, discussed so far. And uh, for my part, I like to, to see this phase two T3 trial as like you have to make choices on a number of uh, aspects of your phase three when you, when you consider um, setting up those trials. You have the operationally seamless and the inferentially seamless, which we uh, discussed. You can also consider whether you want to use the same or an earlier endpoint in the phase two. But you may also think whether you want to take a decision by comparing the arms at the phase two stage or more classically as a, in a generally, I mean, a classical phase two, having just a randomized phase two, but where you, your control group is more like an anchor, an internal control, 
And then uh, for the statisticians, uh, for the phase two part, we can be uh, frequentist or Bayesian. Um, you know that many of the uh, platform trials now uh, are done with the Bayesian framework. So essentially this um, picture summarizes all the decision points. And now when, when you do comparisons, uh, there will be some subtle differences between the circumstances where you just have one experimental arm and a control and um, the cases where you start off with more than, than two arms and you want to do some kind of selection. So maybe it's time to give an example. Yeah, I think to, it's a good idea. Because it's becoming very abstract. Yes, there time. are too many options. <laughs> so maybe I will start with, uh, say, an inferentially seamless study in anaplastic glioma, where we will use an early endpoint for the decision. We have two arms to start up, and we will do the selection based on, on the two-arm comparison, a little bit like the example that I, I just showed. Uh, in the illustration for the, the choice of endpoints, and we will be using a frequentist framework as is most often done in uh, the phase three setting. So the example is uh, a relatively old uh, study, so the question is not any more current, but this is a phase two, three trial of bevacizumab combined with lomustin, versus lomustin alone for patients with Temozolomide resistant recurrent anaplastic glioma. So the, the median PFS and the median OS with lomustine alone are respectively 5.1 and 14.6 months. And the phase three that is envisioned uh, is a trial that aims to show superiority on survival with a target to increase uh, by about five months the median OS, so a hazard ratio of 0.75 at 90% power. And the idea is to recruit in 30 months uh, a total that was calculated to be um, six, 675 patients, and then to follow them up for uh, another 20 months for the final analysis. But then uh, there is a phase two segment. So those patients are included in the total of the phase three with a no a go no go decision based on progression free survival that is a much earlier endpoint where you see that in this case, the effect size that is uh, thought is uh, bigger. It corresponds to a hazard ratio of 0.61. And uh, in this case, we, we have designed the trial really more in the form of uh, one needs to see a sufficient si sign of effect on, on PFS to continue the trial. And if we don't, then uh, we stop. So we designed the trial like a superiority trial with 95% power and a one-sided alpha of 20% for the phase two. And the go-no-go -no -go is to say, well, if the p-value is less than 0.20, then uh, we, we stop. So it means that really the effect is not uh, sufficiently uh, big. And you may wonder about, uh, say, the impact of this early decision rule on the final power of the phase two, three integrated undertaking. I think what is important to note when you take this uh, kind of approach is that the power for your phase two, three combined will be bounded, so will always be above the product of the two powers. And the reason for this is that in order to reject at the end of the phase three, you first need to succeed in passing the condition of the phase two. So the power is the 95% power to pass the phase two multiplied by the power of the phase three. However, in terms of type one error, we see that we use a relatively large type one error for the um, phase um, two. And that is of no concern because to do a false positive at the end of the phase three, you may need to, to do a false positive at the end of the phase two, but you're bounded by the type one error of the phase three. So the type one error for this integrated phase two, three will be just the minimum of the two type one errors that you've chosen for, for, for the phase two and for the phase three. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so that, if I understand correctly, there is no concern with, with type one error. 
uh, what you just said. In, in, but then what is the gain of doing a phase two, three instead of separate phase two, three trials? This is, I'm not convinced what, about that. And also what is the interplay between it, using different endpoints and the potential impact of, the, of this on power? Is, is there an impact? You know, is, is the fact that I use different endpoints more impactful on, on power uh, versus not using different endpoints? Right, I understand. It's th those are really uh, the major concerns when, when and the questions that one should ask uh, every time that uh, one uses this this kind of approach. Um, if we look at this uh, very example where where we we were going for um, a, a study of 225 patients, pretty much for the uh, phase two study and uh, a total of 675 patients. So obviously, if you do separate phase two and three, you will have at least to accrue the sum of those numbers, right? So, so you potentially might uh, spare 25% of, of your patients. However, as we've seen before, there may be a delay in accumulating the information about the PFS events so that you might have actually accrued some more than the 225 that you planned by the time when you effectively know the uh, results of this uh, interim analysis. In terms of time, uh, compared to writing a phase three protocol after having done the phase two, if you count that the phase two alone would last about 14 months as seen on this graphic, um, you probably gain those 14 months plus the time it would have taken you to write and set up the, the phase three protocol, which is an activity that was done before starting the phase two. So in total, you may time, uh, take gain quite some time. Of course, there is a risk in that you've done all this activity, but you may decide not to continue in phase three, in which case those efforts are in a way uh, wasted. Now to your other question about the design performance, as we've indicated, uh, the type one error is controlled for, for both, say, for, for, for both segments uh, at, at the type one error that was specified. But in terms of power, um, once we're dealing with different endpoints, we have to evaluate the power in, in a number of circumstances because you may assume here we've assumed 0.61 as the hazard ratio for PFS and, and 0.75. But of course, if you change the magnitude of the effect for PFS, you may uh, come up with different values of, of the power. You also uh, have to consider the impact of the correlation between the two endpoints, although uh, simulations generally show that the amount of correlation between the endpoints, so be it 0.33, very weak or, or very strong, that has a relatively modest impact on the power, which is relatively good news, it generally between one or two percent of power that will change. Um, now, in terms of whether you, I mean, if, if you pick an early endpoint that is not representative, so if, if for example, you, you, you imagine that your drug by lack of chance will not show an effect on your early endpoint, then of course this strategy will lead you to take the wrong decision to stop, but that wouldn't be different from uh, picking a wrong endpoint in your phase two that you do separately from uh, your phase three. Uh, in terms of uh, statistics, you will need simulations to uh, demonstrate the performance and to optimize the decisions um, that uh, the decision rule. You may wish to, to run simulations and to fine tune your decision rule according to some uh, power configurations and, and plausible uh, circumstances. Okay, then I have a, a few further questions. I think you mentioned it briefly, but can I use a non-comparative design for the phase two component, um, still in an inferentially seamless design? Is, is there a role for uh, Bayesian designs in this particular setting? And is, is there any concern uh, related to operational characteristics? Yeah, that, uh, these are again, excellent questions. And maybe it's best if I show you another example to illustrate this kind of uh, approach. And here, um, so we are discussing an inferentially seamless, but this time we have a within arm comparison, 
as opposed to what we explained before. So this is another example, uh, this time in, uh, in CLL, where um, the design was really uh, a phase two um, design that was applied to one of the two arms of the trial uh, with a classical um, two-stage phase two design being applied to the experimental arm. And the primary endpoint for this uh, phase two in this case was MRD negativity. So the, the drug is really uh, believed to uh, have an impact through uh, say rescuing patients who were presenting with minimum residual disease to turn them into uh, negative MRD patients. And uh, so what they, they did is that they randomized patients, but they uh, applied a Simon two-stage design to one of the arm using the uh, six months MRD negativity rate as their primary endpoint. And those results were assessed by an IDMC. And uh, when this uh, study was positive, then the trial continued to recruit uh, into the phase three for a randomized comparison that would compare um, the uh, two trials based on uh, progression-free survival. So again, because it's inferentially seamless, the results are seen by an IDMC and the, the phase two data, the patients in the phase two would be included in the phase three analysis. I think in, in practice, this trial was terminated. But then you see here that the, um, say the target for um, the phase two success was to outperform a rate of 15%. And the power calculations for the Simon design were conducted under uh, the hypothesis that there would be a negativity rate of 35%. That's really the frequentist approach to just assume a fixed value for the uh, target effect. Uh, the Bayesian approach to, to running this kind of uh, early stopping rule would be rather to assume, unlike in the former uh, circumstance, to make an assumption as regards the probable rate that you can expect with your treatment. So you, you would, instead of assuming it's 35%, you would probably start by assuming it can be anywhere. And then as you accumulate data, you will update your belief. And that's what the uh, a bit ugly equations says. You start with, a, with a, an assumption about your the distribution of your response rate for your experimental treatment, you accumulate data and you mix the two to update what you know of your uh, distribution. So in this case, if you started with the green, which would be, I don't know at all where this response rate is, and I observe four responses in 15 patients, the, the red curve shows how the uh, likely distribution of your um, study uh, would uh, be after the experiment. So the Bayesian go-no-go -no -go, uh, decisions could be based on what we, we, we call the posterior probability, which is this updated probability that can be calculated. And then you would have a go decision to say, for example, if the probability that the true response rate after having done the experiment, uh, that this response rate is above 50% is greater than 80%, then uh, I continue. Otherwise, I stop. Now, we've discussed that uh, sometimes there is a, a lag time in observing the response. With this approach, what you can also do is instead of using the posterior probability to go for the predictive probability. And so, for example, to make a projection, look at your uh, time point of analysis as an interim analysis on the MRD negativity in this case, and to try to project if you would potentially pass this uh, go decision once you've accumulated more data. So you can um, repeatedly evaluate this uh, condition as, as you, you go into your trial. Now, the problem with uh, the um, single arm tests, uh, as we do here, be them using a frequentist or a Bayesian approach, is that because the decision is not quite based on a comparative assessment of the two treatment arms. It's, it's very difficult to evaluate the impact of the decision rule on 
the performance of the phase three. So one would have really to make uh, a model of how the MRD negativity in the uh, experimental arm will impact the final endpoint to be able to, to evaluate this. So in this particular study, it was really not taken into account. And in general, it can be seen like that as well. You just apply the decision rule and you say, well, like in a phase two, if I miss the, the goal, I, I stop, right? But that's uh, in general what happens for the uh, single arm decisions is that it's more difficult to evaluate the um, um, impact on the, on the overall performance. Okay, thank you. That's uh, becoming um, making the puzzle in my head. <laughs> but now let me give you a more concrete example of what I have in mind for a phase two, three uh, trial in a specific situation for. Uh, uh, advanced breast cancer. So um, I'm thinking about a study uh, uh, in a setting for which the median PFS is, say, seven months in the literature, and the average uh, response rate is around uh, 20%. Um, we, we have indication that rhesus responses are a fairly good um, early endpoint. And uh, there's even a, a meta-analysis that indicates a high correlation between uh, uh, ORR and, and PFS. The problem is that I have two, um, I have two uh, potential uh, regimens of my drug. So let's call them A and B. And I, I was thinking about, in phase two, comparing uh, these two regimens with control, and then decide uh, for phase three the best between A or B and compare again against control. But again, having in phase two, the response rate as the endpoint, I have the expectation that it will increase from 20% to say 55% for the best arm, hopefully. And in phase three, I would target a hazard ratio of 0.7 based on the current practice in the literature. So what do you think of this? All right, so you, you're really discussing what we call a pick the winner uh, phase two design. So we haven't discussed this uh, so far. And, and the way I would see it based on um, the uh, indications that, that the information that you just provided is that probably you would want your, your trial to uh, require 340 progression free survival event to get to your power of 90%. And um, that's what you need if you don't do interim analysis. And I suppose that you would want to conduct your phase two in not too many patients, if I understand. I suppose that some, somewhere like close to 50 would, would do, is that Yeah, correct? that would be reasonable. Right, and you don't want to interrupt recruitment. Mm, um, no, preferably not. Preferably not, right. So in this case, um, we could, we could all go in, 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 in the following way. So we would just recruit 50 patients per arm, then evaluate the response, but we would need to take the response uh, probably pretty early, don't we? Because we don't want to wait for the, the late responses, right? Do, do you feel comfortable with having yeah. response evaluated early? I'd say so, yes, yes, Rel the... relatively early. Cycles? Let's say two cycles, two, two three cycles. Two, three course. cycles yes. at most, yes. right? Yeah. And okay, and that doesn't raise any concerns. You, you think you will capture most of your responses? I would, I would think so. Right. And let's assume we don't need to confirm them. Right. Okay. So we will need to take that into account. So the 20 and the 55 percent, maybe we need to lower them a little bit eventually, but we'll discuss that later. So if I see your trial, I would think that you can do indeed with 50 patients per arm and uh, recruit, this is a picture for two arms, so it's representing what happens for, for the picked arm in the phase three. So as before, the patients in red, the PFS events for two arms in total in green, and the PFS events in the control arm in blue. And to have 50 patients per arm uh, for two arms, that would be about, at say, around six or seven months. But as you indicated, your analysis would require to follow the patients for just over two months um, then to have the results. So probably it would take around a good 
three, three to four months to have the uh, phase two analysis and selection. So during that time, you don't uh, stop the recruitment. So it means that you will probably recruit to the not selected arm uh, an extra amount of about 40 patients while you're waiting uh, for your results. That's something to uh, take into account. As you indicated, you wanted a hazard ratio of 0.7 and you have a correlation of 0.75. So here I just, you can use A and B interchangeably, but what you have to take into account when you, you, you conduct these kind of designs that the power of the phase two, three combined will very much depend on how different your two experimental arms are. So if, for example, you take this selection, which is pick the winner strictly. So you look at the uh, observed odds ratio, how your two arms compare to the control, and the one that looks the best, you, you decide to, I mean, you, you tell the IDMC to, to choose uh, that one, unless there would be, of course, uh, strong safety concerns. Um, if really one of your two arms has a 55% response, and the other one is just like the control, then this selection will always inevitably pick the arm that works. And if you assume this strong correlation, then the power for this phase two, three combined will be 86%. Now, if you are in a slightly less robust situation where uh, your second arm is still active, but not quite as much, then it may be picked a few times just because of random fluctuations. And we see that in that case, the power for the combination goes down to 80%. So that's something to take into account in those designs is that you will need to simulate your operating characteristics under a, a, a number of scenarios and uh, that your performance will always be the best when one arm really strikes out as being the best. And of course, there is a clear association between the early and the last, late endpoint. In terms of inference, because we are, and that's a point we didn't touch so far, because we, we're doing an integral phase two, three, and the patients will be recycled and reused. So when we use the, uh, and we pick the best treatment of two, then in order to do a proper inference that uh, corrects for this uh, selection that you actually pick the best arm based on OR, but you believe that OR is predicted for PFS. So actually your interim is dragging your PFS results towards a significant uh, difference. You need to use uh, combination tests with uh, corrections for both the multiplicity and uh, the fact that you have two segments in your trial. So you will need to, to separately analyze the patients before and after the interim and to combine those two uh, tests. So statistically, it's a little bit uh, more uh, convoluted. Okay. Do, do you feel um, yeah. that's a solution to your I problem? I think it might be the way to go, but I, I still have one concern. I, I would feel more comfortable having a say on the go, no go decision in the selection of arms. As you say, the IDMC will, will do it based on pre-specified rules, but there's always, you know, uh, a combination of factors, uh, both between efficacy and safety, but also uh, what's going on inside the company, as well as changes in the landscape. How how do you suggest I deal with that? So, if you want to do it yourself, clearly you shouldn't go for this inferentially seamless because that that really is the one thing that you trade. So, if you if you want to do um, do the selection yourself, then I would really recommend that uh, you go for an operationally seamless uh, phase two, three, and not for an inferentially seamless. So you could do a, a similar kind of uh, decision rule here. I've shown one with a posterior probability selection. So you, you just um, decide to, to, to pick the one that has the best probability. Um, now, if you want to shorten the time that you have to follow up here in the phase two and maybe uh, try to shorten a little bit the time, there may be, but that has to be studied on a case by case basis, there may be uh, a possibility of maybe making a, an, an interim analysis of the phase two itself 
attempting to predict the results as they would be at the end of the phase two, and maybe already make an early selection if you wish to try to get your phase three started uh, earlier. But of course, this will come at the cost that you might actually start sometimes your phase three, um, and then your final analysis of the phase two will not confirm that uh, it was the right decision. But as always, when you want to gain somewhere, you, you have to give something in, in return. So that would be my solution for you. Okay, I guess it makes sense. Well, you gave us a lot of food for thought, Laurence, and I will try to summarize everything you said, and please add if I miss something. So I think as by way of conclusion, we can think about pros and cons um, in, in two different ways. First, between a separate phase two and phase three versus a phase two three combined, in, 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 and then between inferentially seamless and operationally seamless. So, so for the first distinction, uh, for separate phase two and three, um, this uh, gives me more time to learn from phase two and make decisions. Uh, arguably, these might be better decisions just because I have more time and information. There is uh, the same kind of advantage in terms of accounting for whatever is happening outside of my trial, like the therapeutic landscape that I mentioned. Uh, also, there's lesser uh, upfront commitment of resources because I, I worry about the phase two first, uh, at least in principle. Uh, but, but then overall, there may be a larger number of patients and so from, from not, not reusing patients. So, so this may be a, a double-edged sword, let's say. Uh, and overall, I think uh, the, the development is, is, is longer, is lengthier. Uh, if I think about a phase two, three, potentially, of course, I gain time. Uh, this may require more complete knowledge about endpoints, treatment effects, biomarkers, etc., like we said in the beginning. And um, we, we didn't touch very much on, upon this, but um, usually uh, some agencies like replication of results, right? Uh, sometimes when they talk specifically about two phase three trials, or, or even for myself, I, I would like to replicate results. So if I have separate uh, phase two and phase three, the phase three is a replication of the phase two, whereas if I have an inferentially seamless phase two, three, um, this may not be the case. But if I understand correctly, in all cases, I have to be very careful about assessing uh, the cost benefit of, of the two types. And likewise for operationally seamless versus inferentially seamless. With, with operationally seamless, there's no concern with type one error. And, and at the end of the phase three, the inference is done in a classical, very accepted way. Um, uh, the selection uh, at the end of phase two, I, I can do it myself as a sponsor, and I can use uh, phase three to, to replicate uh, phase two. I can, uh, by doing a, a master protocol, I can have uh, more, I can gain efficiency uh, as opposed to having two separate studies, but maybe I don't have enough information up front and I may need to do one or more um, minor or major amendments to phase three along the way. For the inferentially seamless, this is an adaptive design. Uh, uh, clearly, it requires more, more advanced and specific statistical methods. Uh, I need to be using the same population in phase two and in phase three, and I must collect data for, for all endpoints for both phases, even though I may have different primary endpoints, I have to have data on all endpoints for all patients because there will be reuse. Uh, the protocol may be more elaborated. I have to uh, sufficiently justify uh, why I'm doing this as opposed to separate studies. And uh, if I understand correctly, this may not be suitable for registration in cases where um, we may need um, a, a replication or let's say two phase three trials. And again, the, the issue of cost benefit, I guess, is is always there. Do you have anything to add before we switch to the QMA? I would say for registration applications, I think probably having two phase three, one of which would be adaptive, uh, it's regarded as acceptable, but I, I doubt that it would be accepted to go with one single phase three. That would have been a phase two, three seamless trial. That I think would not be really well perceived by okay. the uh, authorities. All right, thank you very much. Um, 
So Kelsey, I'll hand back to you for the for the Q and A. Uh, we have five minutes. Hopefully, we can address some questions from the audience. Great, and thank you both so much for your presentation. That was excellent. Um, and to our audience, just a quick reminder, you can submit any questions that you have through your questions panel um, in your control panel. So feel free to submit those. And any questions that we don't get to, we can always reach out and, and answer those afterwards. Um, so we'll start with our first question from the audience. I think it's more of a point of clarification here. Um, someone asked, did I hear you say that if a sponsor wants to be making the decision to go or no go, they should not use the inferentially seamless design? That's correct. If the um, in the phase two three, if it's inferentially seamless, the phase two is actually an interim analysis of the phase three, and for that reason, to maintain the integrity of this phase three trial, the decision will be deferred to an independent body that will receive instructions as to what are the rules for go and no go, and will apply them. But the data will remain confidential to the sponsor so that the phase three is not uh, influenced by the results of the phase two in terms of uh, operations and um, sponsor involvement. So that's correct. Okay, great. That's the, really uh, one, one element that sponsors fail to appreciate to its true measure is that that's what they trade against doing a, a single trial. Okay, great. Thanks for answering that. Um, so our next question, um, uh, someone just asked again, would you address again why a single phase three study would not be acceptable? And I don't know if it's helpful to flip back to any slide that describes that. But yeah, um, I, I think I, I mentioned that in, in some context. It's true that, for example, oncology is an exception. In, in oncology, oftentimes there is approval based on a single phase three trial, but there is this provision uh, at least in the US, to the best of my knowledge, uh, but about in general, uh, FDA approving drugs that are uh, uh, tested in two phase three trials. In, in other words, there needs to be a, a confirmation, but I think oncology is kind of an exception. Right, right. and I think the view is that if you do one single phase three, the regulators would generally like to have a separate confirmation of the phase two results in a different trial. Because if you go with one phase three, that also includes the phase two, you're actually moving from a package that has a phase two and two phase three to one trial at all, yeah. with no replication at all of, of the early results, nor of the final results. So I think our point is that you need to really speak with the regulators and make sure that this is acceptable to them. So maybe if you have already a lot of the phase two data and you're now coming with an expansion and an indication, a change of indication that they would be willing to review a single uh, study that would be as a phase two, three. But if it's, say, uh, your major application, then probably it's not uh, acceptable to come with one trial and then uh, have it also encompass the phase two. So I don't know if that's a clarification of our statements. There is no single rule, but also for rare cancers, uh, they, they tend to accept one trial. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Our next question, um, what do you recommend to adjust a, a recently started phase two trial that wants to use the population for a phase three registrational trial in oncology? Could you please repeat the question? Sure. Uh, what do you recommend for a recently started phase two trial that wants to use that population for a phase three registrational trial in oncology? So we're I'll let Laurence uh, respond, but we're assuming that the questioner means that the, the phase two was started as a phase two, as a, not, not as a phase two, three, right? That's what we have okay. to assume, I suppose. Right. Um. Yeah, that, I mean, it, it probably will very much depend on the framework under which this phase two is started, because you would need to have already in the patients, for the patients that uh, you want to recycle, who have had 
before you had the idea of turning the study into a phase three to have set up the same constraints as, as for phase three. So I think it's probably difficult to, unless everything was blinded and no one uh, saw the results and you have really solid proofs to demonstrate that, um, to, to really turn the trial into a, a registrational phase two, three uh, after it's been uh, launched. But again, it depends how many patients you've recruited already, if it's just a handful of them and your very quick tech may fly. But I wouldn't think it's a given. You have to also think of all the other operational aspects that may be very different between a phase two and a phase three, including the sites in, in which you, you recruit uh, for your phase three and, and your phase two. So it has to be discussed with, with the regulators. There is no, no one size fits all uh, solution to that. Great. And I know that we've reached the top of the hour, so I think we're going to have to answer any remaining questions uh, later on. Um, but thank you very, very much, everyone, for attending. Um, thank you very much for our speakers, uh, Laurence and Everardo. Um, that was excellent. Um, just a few quick notes for our audience. Um, if we couldn't get to your questions, like I said, we'll follow up after this presentation. And if you do have any further questions, you can just send those over to info at IDDI.com. Again, thank you so much for attending. Um, there should be a survey window that pops up um, after the webinar closes, so we'd always appreciate your feedback there if you can send that over. Um, and yeah, I, I hope everyone had um, a great time um, participating and felt that like this was very informative. It's been a pleasure being your moderator. Uh, we thank you, our audience, again, and thank you to our speakers. Thank you, Kelsey. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a good thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.